he has his more hundred dollars worth of paper. <laughs> qualifications not in any chapter it stands it stands alone but I have a whole separate video for it and uh, and I'll send you the link to that video as well and we'll go and go over it next week it's not that we're not going to cover it but I'm going to go ahead and send you the video link if you want to watch it but my loan qualification qualification is just separate it's one of those things that is not in the chapter but they've included it on the exam so. no buyer loan qualification All right, chapter 18, taxation of real property. Now, we're not talking about property taxes here. We are talking about income taxation. Everybody good with that? Talking about income taxation here. When you are dealing with real estate, there's always going to be tax implications to owning real estate. And most of those tax implications are good ones. Most of the time, owning real estate has significant tax advantages. Some of those tax advantages are gonna be based on whether you own it as your home or whether you own it as an investment property. They both have tax advantages. They're different tax advantages. Everybody good with me on that? The first thing you need to understand about this chapter for those of you who've never encountered this before, if you haven't done your own tax, first of all, if you're not doing your own taxes, unless you're in some sort of a special circumstance, start doing your own taxes. You will be absolutely shocked at what you would actually learn about the world by doing your own taxes. TurboTax is your friend. I promise you can do it. And you will be shocked. Plus, you will have a much better idea of what things you can and cannot write off when you get this professional license that you're about to get. And you will get a much better outcome if you learn how to do it. I'm not saying don't have an account and look at it. You can have them look over it. But you ought to do it yourself so you can figure out what's going on. All right? Those of you that haven't done your own taxes, you're going to have to have a crash course in this chapter about some terminology when it comes to taxation. When real estate is concerned, there are two different types of income taxes that we might have to deal with. Number one are the annual income taxes that you're all familiar with. You do a tax return no later than when every year? April 15th. And you owe taxes to the federal government based on income that you generated in the previous year. Now, could you generate income as a result of owning real estate? Yes, from what? Where's the money coming from? Rent. If you have rental properties that are generating a positive cash flow, does that make sense for everybody? So your income that's generated is your cash flow, that before tax cash flow. Well, guess what tax it's before? Before you pay what? Income taxes on that number. So whatever amount of money is generated by that property, it's before tax cash flow you have to pay income taxes based on that number. Is everybody good with that? Okay. That's the first type of taxes we need to talk about. The second type of taxes we need to talk about is something called a capital gains tax. Capital gains taxes you do not pay all along. You don't pay them annually because you don't have a capital gain annually on the property. You only have a capital gain potentially when you sell a property. So a cap, what do you think a capital gain is? If a capital gain is only going to be something that you have when you sell the property, and a capital gains tax would be something you only pay when you sell the property, what do you think a capital gain is? It's profit when you what? When you sell. So it's going to be the difference pretty much between what you paid for it and what you sold it for, and you pay taxes on that profit. That profit is called a capital gain. Does that make sense for everybody? So you got two different kinds of taxes and you owe both. One, you owe an annual income tax and that's based on what number? 
your before tax what? Cash flow. That's the amount of money. That formula is not just useless. We don't do it to just torture you. You need that formula to calculate how much of an income you've produced with the property because once you know how much of an income you've produced, you can calculate how much you owe in what? In taxes. And then when you do sell the property, if you turn a profit when you sell it, you pay a whole separate tax on that profit called a what? A capital gains tax. You only have a capital gain if you sell it for what? More than you pay for it. What, can you have a capital loss? Yes. Absolutely you could. Absolutely you could. Everybody good with the difference between the two? Okay. One you pay annually, one you pay when you sell. So let's talk about some, some annual tax benefits. We're not talking about capital gains tax here. We're talking about your annual income tax return. There are some tax benefits to owning real estate. First of all, you need to understand the differences. Real estate is not just houses. We gotta break down here. We gotta get more detailed. There are tax benefits to owning all real estate. Some of those benefits are specific to owning your home. Though. These are the ones that are specific to owning your home. And even more specifically to that, they're related to owning your home and having a loan. So guess what? If you don't own a home, guess what you don't get? Any of these advantages. If you, don't, if you own a home but you don't have a loan on it, guess what you don't get? Any of these advantages. You get these advantages if you own your own what? Home and you have a what? A loan on it, a mortgage loan. That's what we mean by these are loan-related tax advantages to owning your home. Does that make sense to everybody? These are going to be what we call tax deductions. Now, a tax deduction does not dollar for dollar reduce the tax you owe. What does it reduce? It reduces your income, what your taxes are based on. So if you make $50,000 but you have $10,000 in tax deductions, then how much are you going to pay taxes on? $40,000. Does that make sense? It's not a dollar for dollar reduction in the tax owed, it's a dollar for dollar reduction in the income that your tax is based on. So examples of things that you can deduct as a result of owning your own home and having a mortgage. The interest on first and second homes. So any interest that you pay on up to how many homes? Two. Two. And by the way, an RV, camper, it's a home, according to the IRS. And you can deduct the interest on how many? Two. Two. So could you deduct the interest on your primary residence and on an RV? Absolutely. Absolutely. Up to two homes. Everybody all right with that? Additionally, discount points. Well, that makes sense because discount points are really just what? Think back. Thank God. What are discount points? Prepaid Pre what? Interest. And we just said interest was what? Tax deductible. So it makes sense if interest is tax deductible, that discount points would what? would also be tax deductible. Now the big difference with interest and discount points is interest is calculated annually, whereas discount points you pay all when? <laughs> all up front. So you deduct the discount points all in the year of purchase. But they are tax deductible. Mortgage insurance premiums. So if you have mortgage insurance, and when would you have mortgage insurance? If you borrowed what, more than what loan to value? more than 80% loan to value, you're going to have a mortgage insurance premium. That is tax deductible as well on a conventional or a government buy. There's mortgage insurance on, there's private mortgage insurance on conventionals and government mortgage insurance, but all of it is tax deductible. So if I have an FHA, can I deduct the mortgage insurance on it? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And then finally, origination fees. So. Whenever the, the year you get the loan, the origination fees are also tax deductible. Is this a lot of tax deductions right here? Yeah. Absolutely. And you get these as a result of two things. You own what? Your own home and you have what? A mortgage on it. Everybody good with all that? Okay. Now, there are additionally a tax benefit, one tax benefit, 
that applies to everybody who owns their home, whether they have a loan or not. So the previous stuff, you had to own your own home and have a loan. This one applies even if you don't have a loan. Your annual property tax bill that you pay, those real property taxes that we've learned to calculate, are a tax deductible expense. So you can write those off as a tax deduction as well. So if you pay $4,000 a year in property taxes, you got a $4,000 what? Deduction. Does that make sense for everybody? So could these deductions add up very quickly for a, a homeowner? Especially a homeowner who has a loan. Absolutely. Do you start to see the biggest benefit from somebody converting from being a renter into a homeowner? Because if they're a renter, are they most likely paying interest on a loan somewhere? Yes. Yeah, just not theirs. On somebody else's. Do they get to write off that interest? No. But if they own the home themselves, they do get to write it off. I mean, think of it this way. What's 5% interest on a $200,000 loan? That's $10,000 a year as a deduction, right? And if we got another $4,000 in property taxes, there's $14,000. We got another $2,000 in mortgage insurance. We have a $16,000 tax deduction in that year. Is that going to make a difference in somebody's tax bill? Yeah. Big one. Big one. This yes, Right, because you were previously not itemized and it throws you into itemization territory. Right? It makes a big difference. Big difference. Okay? Oh, are we understanding this so far? So those are the tax benefits for your annual income taxes as a result of owning a home. Now we want to shift gears. We want to get away from annual income taxes and we want to get into capital gains taxes. What did we say a capital gain was? When you buy the property, you sell it later on for what? Profit. A profit. You bought the property, you sold it down the road for a profit. That's called a capital gain. And yes, Uncle Sam wants a piece of that action. And that's called a capital gains tax. A capital gains tax. Capital gains are taxable. Now you, for the test, need to know the difference between a short-term capital gain and a long-term capital gain. It's a very simple difference. It depends on how long you own the property. If you own the property for less than a year, from the time you bought it to the time you did what with it, sold it, then that is called a short-term capital gain. If you own the property for more than a year, it's called a long-term capital gain. Here's the tax benefit, and here's the difference. This is why they have two different names. Short-term capital gains are just considered income, like any other income, like you got a job and you got paid money, which means you pay taxes on short-term capital gains at your normal income tax rate. So for example, if you fall on 25% tax bracket, what percentage of that gain would you pay if it was a short-term capital gain? 25%. Does that make sense for everybody? Because a short-term capital gain is just income. Whereas a long-term capital gain is capped. Long-term capital gains are not taxed at your normal tax rate. The vast majority of long-term capital gains are taxed at, are taxed at 15%. So if you're in a 25% tax bracket, would it be a big benefit for you to hold that property for at least a year? Yes. Yeah, because you save a big chunk on cap. So when would this come into play? Like if you're flipping a house, y'all watch flip or flop, right? Well, in some cases, they own those properties for less than a year, right? And if you can buy it and sell it in three months, sure, go ahead. But if it's already month 11, and you're going to have a $50,000 capital gain, and, and they're probably in a 35% tax bracket because they make a lot of money. Which would you rather do, sell it at month 11 and pay 35% capital gains or keep it for another month and a half where it's a long-term capital gain and pay 15%? Which would you rather do? Keep it. Keep it. So sometimes you might have to give somebody advice about something like that and say, well, you know, if you keep it as a long-term capital gain, you'll pay a much lower tax rate. Does that make sense to everybody? 
Okay? That's the difference between a short-term capital gain and a long-term. You don't need to memorize these numbers except for 15%. Capital gains are pretty much taxed at 15% as long as they are long-term capital gains. And most capital gains are long-term capital gains when you talk about real estate. Because most of the time, don't you own property for longer than a year in most cases? So most of these transactions are going to be long-term capital gains. Yes, ma'am. Not yet. I mean, we haven't got, we're going to get to it, but I haven't. Okay. Um, so, something tells me Lisa's going to pull taxes. <laughs> <laughs> so, something tells me Lisa's going to pull taxes. Alright. We're good so far? Now, more math. Except it's been deleted. It's gone away. They've removed it officially. Now, I have left it in your slide packet, and here's why. You can't ignore this, because they still expect you to know how a capital gain is calculated. They just don't expect you to actually do the math of it. Is everybody with me on that? So what that means is you still have to memorize the terms and know how it's done. We said a capital gain is basically the difference between two numbers, what you bought it for and what you sold it for. Keep that in mind. That's realistically what we're trying to do. Here's the thing though. What I bought it for doesn't really tell you the whole picture because I might have done what while I've owned it? I might have improved it. I might have invested money in it while I've owned it. Does that make sense for everybody? So if I've made improvements on that property, I want to take that into account because I don't want to pay a bunch of taxes. Yeah. Oh yeah, it went up $200,000 in value, but I spent $100,000 on the damn thing. Does that make sense for you? I don't want to pay taxes on 200, I want to pay taxes on 100. So, we need to talk about something called an adjusted basis. The adjusted basis is how much money the owner has actually invested in the property. Well, obviously that's going to start at what they paid for it, but could they invest more money in it? Yes. By doing what? Improving it. Not only could they invest more money in it by improving it, don't they really pay more to buy it than just the sales price? Yes. Don't they have to pay for things like appraisals and inspections and closing attorney's fees and all that stuff? Does that make sense? Yes. So the adjusted basis is really the total of what this owner has invested in the property. Is everybody good with that? with the exception of maintenance. Maintenance is not part of an adjusted basis. That's what you were asking about earlier. Okay? Maintenance is not part of an adjusted basis. The basic assumption is that you will do maintenance anyway. Improvements are, so let me give you a comparison of what I mean there. Fixing the roof, is that gonna be something that's gonna impact our adjusted basis? No. Putting on a new roof, would that be something that would impact our adjusted basis? Yes. yes. Painting the house, would that be something that would impact our adjusted basis? No. Putting new siding on the property, that would absolutely affect our adjusted basis. Does that make sense? Repairing the air conditioner, yes or no? No. Putting a new HVAC system in. Yes. Yes. So the adjusted basis is going to be every dime we've invested in the property except basic maintenance expenses. Is everybody okay with that? What's that called again? Adjusted, adjusted basis. Listen, that's what you're going to see on a test. And I don't say anything about what I bought for it, what I paid for it. It's going to say adjusted basis. So if you don't know what that means, you're going to be lost. Okay? And I think that's the danger of you not having to learn the math here is you have to really drill down on the vocabulary of this because they've not eliminated the questions, they've just eliminated the calculation. Adjusted basis is what you've invested. Well, the amount realized is what you sold it for, but just like we refined what you paid for it, we're going to refine down what you sold it for. Do you get to keep all the money you sold property for? What do you have to pay at closing right away? An attorney, maybe? God, y'all are bad at this. You forgetting the biggest thing? Uh, ah. Hey, 
anything yourself, right? You gotta pay commissions. So that seller's not gonna wanna use the sales price to determine their profit on the sale. They're gonna wanna take that sales price and start subtracting out all those fees they have to pay to get it sold. Does that make sense? We call that the amount realized. So the amount realized is the number that the seller has left over when they sell after they pay all their expenses. Everybody all right with that? Whereas the adjusted basis is the amount of money they've done what? Invested in the property. The difference between the two is called a what? Capital gain. Adjusted basis or amount realized minus adjusted basis is called a capital gain. And that is the number that we're going to pay 15% of. Everybody good with that? We calculate that capital gain. We owe 15% in taxes. And when would you owe it? The day the property does what? The day it sells. It would come right out of that closing and be sent to the federal government. Everybody all right with that? It's a capital gains tax. So, this is just an example. So, Travis purchased an investment property in 2005 for $150,000, and he's selling it for two twenty-eight. dollars So, just looking at those numbers, what's the max our capital gain could be? No, what's the max our capital gain, not the tax? Look at the difference, $78,000. The maximum our capital gain could be is the difference between the two, right? But we know it's going to be actually less than that because we need to finagle those numbers. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. It said he incurred closing costs, attorney's fee, appraisal, and inspection of $1,500. Is that going to count toward either our adjusted basis or our amount realized? Which one? That's going to go on the adjusted basis side because it was when he purchased the property. And he's done renovations on the property, told him $32,000. Is that going to impact our either adjusted basis or amount realized? Yes. Which one? Adjusted basis. Because adjusted basis is what we've what? Invested in the property. We've done renovations. That's what we've invested in the property. He's paying a 6% commission. Is that going to impact one of those numbers? Yes. Which one? Uh, realize he's paying a 6% commission that's when you sell so you need to start thinking of amount realized as everything on the ownership side and uh, I mean um, adjusted basis is everything on the ownership side and amount realizes everything that happens when you what when you sell it does that, does that make sense to everybody so paying a 6% commission is going to affect the amount realized he's got to pay excise taxes which one's that going to impact Amount realized. He's got to pay attorney's fees. Which one? Realized. So if you look at the math here, his capital gain is actually going to be not $78,000, but $29,964. You've got that in your slides. Does everybody see that? Because what we did is we took the amount realized. What's the sales price minus all the closing costs? So we subtracted the commission. We subtracted the excise taxes. We subtracted the attorney's fees. So our amount realized was all the way down at 213464 And then our, our adjusted basis up here was our purchase price plus all the improvements and money we invested. So our adjusted basis was up at 183.5. The difference between those is only $29,964. That's our capital gain. And so what would we pay taxes on? That number, what percentage? 15%. No, it's still there. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it potentially. Okay? So far, everybody okay on that? You need to know what an amount realized is. You need to know what an adjusted basis is. You need to know that the difference between the two is a what? A capital gain. You don't have to actually do the math, but you better look through that math and make sure it makes sense. Because they're easily going to give you a test question where they're going to want you to know, you know, which one of the following items would impact an adjusted basis. And you're going to be able to have to pick. What, what would you be looking for impacting an adjusted basis? Improvements, right? What else? Attorney's fees when I bought the property, not when I sold it, but when I bought it. What kinds of things would affect an amount realized? Excise taxes, commissions, absolutely. 
So make sure you know how to group those things together. What would impact the adjusted basis and what would impact the amount realized. Everybody all right with that? Okay. Um, now, we could also, if we wanted to, we could go one step further and calculate the tax itself by multiplying by 15%. So the tax that Travis would owe on that is $4,494.60. That's how much tax would be collected out of that closing and sent to the federal government. Somebody asked me one time, well, how do they know all this math? How do they know what your amount realized and your adjusted basis and how do they calculate your capital gain? I'm like, they don't. The closing attorney has no idea what your capital gain is going to be. So they're going to send the tax based on it being the maximum possible. They're simply going to look at what you what? Paid for it and what you sold it for. If it's different than that, what, who has to fix it? You do. You need to send the closing attorney and say, no, here's my capital gain, and so therefore here's the amount of the tax you need to collect. Because otherwise they're going to collect it on the full potential amount. And then would, it would have to wait for you to do your taxes and get a refund the following year when you did your taxes. Because you'd overpaid the capital gains tax. So the capital gains, you don't have until the 15th to pay that? No ma'am, you pay it on the day of closing. Everybody hear a question? She said, you can't wait till April 15th to pay it. No, it gets collected out of the closing. The closing attorney is required by law to disperse it from the closing. So it would come out before the seller ever sees a check. Everybody okay with that? Now, most of you, how many of you have ever sold a house? Do you remember how much was deducted out of your closing for capital gains tax? Do you remember seeing that check at closing? No. You don't? You should have looked closer. <laughs> you know why you don't remember it? It wasn't there. It wasn't there. This is going to be tested. Probably the biggest single advantage of owning a home isn't those annual tax deductions. It comes when you sell that home. When you sell that home, the vast majority of the time, the capital gains tax that you owe is going to be zero because there is a very generous exemption from paying capital gains taxes on your primary residence. The exemption is that you don't pay any tax at all on a gain of $250,000. Not a sales price of 250, but a gain. You think of how rare it is that somebody has a gain in their home of more than $250,000. So somebody could gain $200,000. They could they could buy a house today for $400,000 and sell it three years from now for $600,000 and have a $200,000 capital gain. And how much would they owe in taxes? Zero. <laughs> because the first $250,000 of gain on your primary residence are what? Exempt. Exempt. And if you're married, guess what you do with that number? Double. You double it. If you're married, for a married couple selling their primary residence, the exemption is the first $500,000 of gain is tax-free. Now, could you still have to pay a capital gains tax on your primary residence? Yes, if, if what happens? if your gain goes over these amounts. So if you have a $600,000 capital gain, a married couple selling a house, they have a $600,000 capital gain, are they going to owe some capital gains taxes? Is it going to be on $600,000? It's going to be on what? One hundred, because the first five hundred is going to be completely tax-free. Is that a big tax benefit? Yes. Absolutely it is. Is everybody good on that? Now, Here's what you need to know for the test. Number one, you need to know those numbers, $250,000 for a single individual and $500,000 for a married couple. You need to pay special attention to this phrase, primary residence. You can only have how many primary residences? One. Okay? The IRS gives you a definition of a primary residence. Because if you're going to claim this exemption, they're going to make sure it's actually your home. They're going to make sure you're not selling an investment property that's not really your residence. Does that make sense for everybody? So, here's the rule. 
you have to show that you have lived in that property for a total of two years out of the preceding five years. So, if you sold the house today, today is September what? 9th, 2018. What day are we going back to? September 9th of 2013. And you have to show that since 2000, September 9th of 2013, you've lived in that property for a total of what? Two years. Two years. It doesn't have to be consecutively. It can be a month on, a month off. But as long as you can show two years worth of occupancy as your home in that property, then you can sell it as your primary residence. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, I have had clients come up to me before who wanted to sell investment property that they've owned a long time, a rental house that they've owned for 30 or 40 years. And we did the math and we looked at it and selling it, they were going to have a $300,000 capital gain on it because they've owned it so long. What do you think my advice was to them? Move in it. For how long? Two years. two years. Because if they live in it for two years, guess what it becomes? Their primary residence and they can sell it. And how much are they going to pay in taxes on that $300,000 capital gain? Nothing as a married couple. Does that make sense for everybody? You follow me on that? So this is a major incentive to home ownership here. Everybody good on the exemption here? What's the rule? It's my primary residence if I've lived there how long? Two years. Two out of the previous five. Uh, let me point out something to you because this is a very real world thing that happens a lot. You may deal with people who are in the process of getting married. A married I mean, a, a couple comes to you and they're about to get married and they each own a separate home right now. If they each own a separate home, what is a pretty high likelihood they're going to do at some point around the wedding? It sell at least one, but most likely sell what? Both. Sell both. Trust me. Nobody wants to move into their spouse's house. They're going to sell two and buy what? One. If that's what they plan to do, folks, they need to do that before the wedding. Because if they do it before the wedding, they're both going to get the capital gains exemption. If they wait until after, they're only going to get it on what? One of them, because they're then selling as a married couple and they only get the exemption one time every two years. Okay? So if they want to accomplish that, it would be much better for them to, to sell both of them before they get married. Is everybody all right with that? Okay. In most cases. Unless they have a really big gain on one and a really small gain on the other, they'd be better off to get married and use the $500,000 exemption for the really big gain and just pay the taxes on the small one. So kind of case by case, but usually doing it first would be better. Everybody good on that? I'm not going to go through this math example because you don't have to do that, but it just deals with calculating the capital gains tax. If it's their primary residence, you're just going to apply that exemption. Everybody okay on that? And what is the exemption? If it's your primary residence, you get what? $250,000 of gain that's tax-free for a single person and five hundred dollars that's tax-free for a married couple. Everybody okay on that? Yes. Last thing in the chapter is something called a 1031 tax deferred exchange. What does the word deferred mean? Postponed. Delayed. So you can delay paying a capital gains tax. If you don't want to pay it today, no problem. The government will allow you to do that. Here's the catch, though. It's a big catch. You can't get the money today and not pay taxes on it. You can sell the property, and you can delay paying the taxes, but you can't touch what? The money. You've got to reinvest it. What do you think you have to reinvest it in? another piece of property. It's called a like-kind exchange. You're exchanging real estate for what? For real estate. So rather than taking the money from selling the property, you're selling the property and immediately turning around and reinvesting those funds in the purchase of another property or properties. Does that make sense to you guys? And what that allows is for you to delay paying any capital gains tax until you sell the next property. And could you conceivably sell the next property and do this delay again? Yeah. And, and again. And again. Delay, 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 delay. What happens eventually? You're done. You're done. <laughs> You're done. 
smart lady. You die. And in this case, that's a very good thing. Because here's the magic of that. When you die, you have heirs, right? You're going to leave your property to those heirs. Well, see, the reason I would have to pay a capital gains tax is because I have a profit on the property. Does that make sense for you guys? Because I invested a small amount, now it's worth a big amount, and if I sold it, i got to pay tax on the difference. Does that make sense? If I die and I leave my property to Rosin, if, I'm sorry? If, if I leave it to Lynn, if I leave it to anybody, if I leave that property, here we go. Leave it to Lynn. She's not going to inherit it with my adjusted basis. Guess what her adjusted basis in the property is going to be? Not zero. You don't want it to be zero. Folks, you don't want it to be zero because if your adjusted basis is zero and you sell it for a lot of money, how big is your capital gain? It's huge. What you want is the capital gain to be zero. So what do you think her adjusted basis is going to be? The full market value of the property. So if it's worth $2 million, guess what her adjusted basis is going to be in it? $2 million. And so she turns around and sells it the next day. Does she have to defer paying any taxes? No, because guess what the taxes owed are? Zero. Because from the standpoint of the federal government, how much did she pay for that property? Yes, she did. She paid how much for it? Two million dollars. That's her. That's her adjusted basis, and she just sold it for how much money? Two million dollars. What's the difference between the two? Zero. So how much does she owe in taxes? So that tax that we deferred all those times, all those years, actually became a tax that we what? Completely avoided paying ever. Does that make sense for everybody? You want me to make it sweeter for you? Y'all want to learn how to get rich? Here it is. I'll give it to you in five minutes. Remember earlier we talked about the idea of depreciation and how you could depreciate a property to offset the annual income of a property? Y'all remember we talked about that? So let's say, let's say, for example, that Tommy owns an investment property, just a small little thing. He goes out and he buys a $200,000 investment property. And it's making him $20,000 a year, which is pretty good on a $200,000 property. It's a 10% return. He's making twenty dollars a year. But he doesn't want to pay taxes on that twenty dollars a year. So when he files his income tax return, he's going to claim that the property has done what? Has depreciated, shockingly, by what amount? $20,000. So he made $20,000, but he also lost $20,000, at least on paper. So how much is his income for the year? Zero. Zero. So how much is he paying in income taxes? Zero. Zero. Now here's the catch there, or the supposed catch. He's reducing his adjusted basis in the property by that same $20,000. So presumably at some point when he sells the property, he's going to have a bigger capital gain and owe a bigger capital gains tax. Does that make sense? He's trading off paying an income tax today for paying a capital gains tax later down the road. But we just talked about what he could do with the capital gains tax. So he's going to keep that property. He's going to keep it for 10 years. And why 10 years? Because at 10 years he's going to have depreciated that thing down to what? Zero. Now he can continue to keep the property, but he can't continue to claim depreciation because the federal government's not going to let him depreciate it to less than zero. Does that make sense? So now he's got a decision to make. I can continue owning this property, but now I've got to start paying income tax on this $20,000. Well, he's gotten used to not paying any income taxes. So guess what he's going to do with that property? He's going to sell it. And he's going to do a 1031 tax-deferred exchange. So now when he sells that property, and what's his adjusted basis at this point in time in the property? He's depreciated it down to what? Zero. So his investment in the property is zero now, and he doesn't sell that thing for $200,000 because he's kept it 10 years. It's worth $400,000 now. So he sells that thing for $400,000. What's he going to do with the whole $400,000? He's going to reinvest it in a new property. Here's the ugly thing about that, though. It's not really ugly, but you've got to understand it. He reinvests that $400,000. It doesn't accomplish him anything because he wants to start taking what again? Depreciation. Buying a $400,000 property doesn't accomplish him anything because where did the $400,000 come from? All from the same property, right? And what was his adjusted basis on that property? 
Zero. So if he only bought a four hundred thousand dollar property, guess what? It was just the basis would still be zero. So he can't claim depreciation. He ain't buying a four hundred thousand dollar property. He's buying an eight hundred thousand dollar property. What's he gonna do with the other four hundred? He didn't have the cash for that. What's he gonna do with it? He's gonna borrow it. He's gonna borrow it. He's not pulling any more cash out of his pocket. But he's gonna borrow that money. Because guess what? Is the income generated on an $800,000 property going to be substantially more than the income generated on the property he just sold? Yes. yes it's going to be able to carry that note and still make him not $20,000 a year, but $40,000 a year. So he's gone from making $20,000 a year, not paying taxes on it, to now he's making $40,000 a year. Is he going to claim depreciation? Yes. Yes, and magically how much depreciation is he going to claim? Like $40,000, offset the income. So he's paying how much in income taxes? Zero. Zero. And he's going to do that just long enough to depreciate that one down to what? Zero. Zero too. And then what's he going to do? Sell. He's going to sell it and do a 1031 tax deferred exchange. And now he's sold it for $800,000, but he's not going to buy an $800,000 property. He's going to step up and buy a $2 million property. And what's he going to do with the balance? Going to finance it, right? Because the property's going to generate enough income to pay the note. He's not paying it out of his pocket. And now he's generating $100,000 a year. And what's he going to do with that $100,000 a year? He's going to depreciate the hell out of that new property. And so how much is he going to pay in taxes on that $100,000 a year? How much has he paid in taxes so far his whole life? Nothing. Nothing. And he's going to do that time after time after time. And then he's 75. He dies, and he owns a portfolio of real estate. Because by that time, is it going to be a portfolio of real estate? Mm -hmm. Worth $10 million out of his original $100,000 investment, or $200,000 investment. He owns a portfolio of real estate worth $10 million. Now, he's never paid a single penny in income taxes on all the money generated off of that his whole lot. Does that make sense? What's his adjusted basis in this whole $10 million portfolio at that point? Zero. Pretty dang close to what? Zero, because he's still been doing this depreciation game. And he leaves it to his child. What's his child's adjusted basis going to be? $10 million. That capital gain gets evaporated overnight. And they turn around and do what with it? Sell it. And how much do they pay in capital gains taxes? Not one red cent. There's your five minute lesson on how to get wealthy. Right there. It's called a stepped up exchange, but that's, you don't need to know that. But does that give you some insight in the way a real estate investor thinks? Right. So, do it as a 1031 exchange? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you understand the idea of a 1031 exchange? Okay. The big key here is you can't do what? Can't touch the money. And I mean at all. That money has to stay in an escrow account with the closing attorney. And they, you have a certain amount of time where you have to select a new property and the money has to be reinvested in that property. This is a whole special area of real estate. Six months. Six months total. So it's pretty lenient. Okay. Everybody good? That is it for chapter 18. So in case, in case, and I'll send you an email with a reminder, in case I happen to not see you next week, um, please go ahead and watch the video for chapter 21. You have the slides, you have the math workbook packet to try to make sure we stay, you know, as up to speed as we possibly can. Um, and I'll touch base as we know more about what the weather is going to do. I mean, I know the Weather Channel guy is already in Wilmington, so that's like a pretty much 100% guarantee that it's coming, right? And you know, so he's got a bull's eye on his forehead. So, um, what's his name, Jim Cantori or whatever it is? Uh, he's down there waiting to get blown away on television. So. Um, Y'all have a wonderful week, and we'll talk to you as soon as we can about the weather.